This lecture is going to be based on chapter 17 from Gipinski's Healthcare Finance. This will be a three-part lecture series just to make the file size a little smaller and uh, manageable, but it is three parts covering the entire chapter. Okay, so um, you know, one of the most important part, uh, uh, characteristics of a healthcare organization, of course, is whether it is financially stable and, uh, and viable. And so how do we know whether this is so? Well, we're going to learn in this chapter quite a bit about using ratios to conduct financial analysis, and we'll use both financial statements as well as other operating factors. So we'll first look at uh, using the financial statements to assess financial condition, but then we'll also look at uh, data that we can get that the hospital normally is gathering that we can get to combine with the financial data to explain why and how uh, the hospital is, going, is, is performing. So using from the textbook, uh, we have some examples of an income statement, and I'm not going to spend any time really looking at these because my assumption by chapter 17 is you're already pretty familiar with this, but just very briefly, this is very much an abbreviated income statement, but you remember it has th an income statement has three parts. And the first section is the operating revenue. And so this is a hospital. So the biggest line in the revenue section is going to be net patient services revenue, but they'll likely also have some other kind of revenue like the cafeteria, the gift shop, um, maybe parking, so forth. Then you have uh, operating expenses, right? So this section here is operating expenses. Um, and so here it seems like we've, well, we've divided it out into different kinds of categories. And then, so you have operating revenues, operating expenses, that would give you uh, operating revenue minus operating expenses gives you uh, uh, operating income. And then you have non-operating income, which is from uh, gains and losses that aren't directly related to the operation, the primary uh, the primary business of the organization. So, for example, if this hospital had a gain uh, on investments, which is a common thing for a not-for-profit entity to have, that gain from investments is not part of their operating, properly part of their operating revenue, because they're not an investment organization, right? They're not a, a mutual fund or or a hedge fund. They're a hospital, and so the the gains from investments are properly thought of as non-operating uh, gains or losses if, it's a, if it was a loss from their investments. And then finally, that gives you uh, your bottom line, right? You know that phrase, bottom line, that's your net income. Uh, balance sheet. So balance sheet has two components. The first half or the, you know, typically the left half, if you're looking at it, as a, at it in a side-by-side -side presentation, the left half is going to include the assets, and the assets start with your short-term or current assets like cash, short-term investments, accounts receivable, and inventories. The definition, again, of current asset is something that you can uh, convert into cash or expect to convert into cash or to use up at some point within a year. So that's kind of the, the, the general um, definition of a current asset. And then you have the other assets, I like to call them long-term assets, like gross plant and equipment or property plant and equipment. I lump in here because it's not just plant. Um, uh, and so gross PPE uh, is all the stuff, the physical stuff that the organization owns that's going to last more than a year. And then you have... Uh, so if you have gross property plant equipment, then you're going to have accumulated depreciation, which we've talked about in a previous lecture. And netting those things together gets you net PPE. And you could have other things here like uh, uh, long-term investments and other things, but this is a very simple balance sheet. And so we add all that up to get our, our organization's total assets. Now that was the left side of the balance sheet, the right side of the balance sheet, Whereas the left side of the balance sheet is, is your assets or the things you own, the right side of the balance sheet is, a, uh, is about ownership, right? So left side, things you own, right side, who owns them uh, or who has the rights to them or in, 
or how is the organization financed, right? And so the first portion of the liabilities and equity section or liabilities and net assets, if you were a uh, not-for-profit, are your current liabilities. And so those include accounts payable, accrued expenses, notes payable, so forth, um, as well as the current portion of long-term debt. So uh, imagine that you have um, a 30-year mortgage and you, let's say you just got the 30-year mortgage. The way that that would show up on your uh, balance sheet is uh, if you had a personal balance sheet, the, the portion of the principal that you're going to pay in year one this first year of your mortgage would be up here as a current portion of long-term debt. And then the rest of your, uh, your principal would be down here under long-term liabilities. Uh, but so, so that's what the current portion of long-term debt is. So then you have, just like with the assets, you have where you have current assets, you also have current liabilities and current liabilities represent those liabilities that you expect to have to pay within one year. Then you have the long-term portion, such as long-term debt would be bonds that your organization has taken out, mortgages. Uh, capital lease is a little complicated here, but basically if you have a, a long-term lease that looks a lot like property uh, or, a, or a way of financing, then, then it shows up here on your uh, on your. Uh, balance sheet as a um, liability. And then finally, you have net assets. And that is the phrasing for uh, not-for-profit. If this was a for-profit entity, it would be owner's equity. And this is, of course, a very simplified version of net assets, but uh, you would all, you here you would see unrestricted assets, temporarily restricted assets, and permanently restricted assets on most uh, not for products with entities, and we've already talked about what all that means. So, uh, so then you have your totals and your total, uh, uh, your total of your net assets and your total uh, liabilities should add up to, or does add up to, has to add up to, I should say, the same amount as uh, your total assets. So you see here, one fifty one two seventy eight, one fifty one two seventy eight. So just a that's just a refresh. Okay, something that. Uh, we don't spend a lot of time on, and I wish the book would do a better job of, uh, is the statement of cash flows. Uh, so we'll spend a little bit of time on this. Um, the statement, of, because all significant businesses, uh, you know, businesses of any size, uh, run on accrual basis, meaning revenues coming in and expenses going, uh, you know, uh, or claims on our organization in the form of expenses don't actually translate into cash. The cash often, uh, the actual cash flows often lag the um, uh, capture of uh, those of either the revenues or expenses. Um, the cash flow statement tries to reconcile uh, the accrual information that we have on the income statement and balance sheet uh, to our actual, uh, the actual amount of cash that the organization has. And there are three parts to the statement of cash flows. And what they try to do, what, what each section does is a little bit different uh, and tries to explain uh, to a investor or person who is interested yeah, you know, in the financial statements of the organization, such as an investor, uh, a lender, uh, or maybe a board member, um, where these where the cash is coming from and going to, and what's causing the cash to change, and so we we break down those cash flows into three kinds of activities. The first activity is. Uh, cash that's coming from our operating activities. So if this is a hospital, what we're trying to capture here is the changes in cash that we have in our bank account um, or that we have access to. We want to capture that the changes that happen over the course of a period, you know, usually one year, um, but you could do it in quarter or, or even monthly, depending on, on the need of the organization. Um, but uh, you want to capture here in the operating section, 
you're going to capture the changes in cash that are coming from the core operations of the business. So a hospital, you're looking at primarily stuff that's around the provision of healthcare. Um, and so you start with your operating income and note we're leaving off uh, the non-operating income because it very often the, some of those lines come in as a result of investing or financing activities, which we'll come to next. We increase our cash by the amount that we charged ourselves for depreciation under the operating activities. And the reason we do that is because depreciation, as you remember, is not a cash expense. Depreciation is, is, is put into the income statement to properly charge the organization for the resources that it's using in any given period um, and to account for those long-lived assets, such as the building, right? So you purchase the building in one year, it might be a hundred million dollars, um, but we don't take the hundred million dollars uh, all in the year that we actually, you know, complete the purchase of the building. We spread that cost over, um, in the case of a building, 39 years typically, um, right? I believe is the current allowance uh, by the IRS. Um, so we would, we would take 139th of the building and there's a bunch of different rules about different ways you can do a depreciation, but uh, allowing say for straight line depreciation, you might take, you would take 139th of the building's value each year in terms of depreciation. Um, but that's not an actual cash expense, right? So you have to add that back to your operating income because the operating income understates the amount of cash that the organization brought in by the amount of depreciation that you're charging yourself. So that's one divergence that results from accrual accounting. Because we're trying to match the resources used with the resources gained um, and, and depreciation is is not equal to cash. It isn't cash. It's, it's a, it's a nominal charge. Uh, we have to add it back. Now, if our accounts receivable increase, what does that mean in terms of cash? Well, um, if our accounts receivable increase, that means we've got, we have some floating level of, of accounts receivable all the time, right? We're getting new, uh, we, we bill out for, for services rendered, and then we get payments in for services rendered. And so there's this kind of, it's kind of like, imagine a bathtub uh, partway filled with water, and you turn on the faucet, and so there's water coming in. But at the same time, you pull the plug out of the drain, and so there's water going out. And so accounts re the accounts receivable account is kind of like the value in that account is like the amount of water in a bathtub. If the amount of water coming in the from the faucet is equal to the amount of water that's going out of the drain, then the level of water will always remain the same. But if the amount of uh, water going down the drain is going out at a pace that's faster than the uh, faucet is pouring water back in, then the, um, the accounts receivable amount will go down. So an increase in accounts receivable actually makes our um, uh, cash, as we capture it in the income statement, uh, go down, or we should say, or I should say, um, an, a, a, as a, if our accounts receivable goes up over a period of time, um, then our, um, our operating income is overstating the amount of cash we have on hand by the increase in, the, in accounts receivable. Why is that? Well, our operating income right, is revenues minus expenses. So if our um, revenues are higher, um, a portion of those revenues are falling into our accounts receivable. So if our revenues go up, that's like, uh, you know, um, uh, more, um, yeah, let me think. Uh, if our revenues go up, then um, 
that doesn't mean that we've actually gotten more cash, right? Because say we might actually only collect five or 10% of uh, the billable amount at the time that the patient uh, comes through our, uh, our facility. It might even be less than that. It probably is less than that. Um, so we get some sort of copay when the patient comes through, uh, but then we bill the, uh, we bill the uh, insurer for the remainder. Well, if our accounts receivable go up, uh, if our revenues go up and then our accounts receivable go up, it looks like we've got more cash as a result of our operating income also going up. But if our accounts receivable are increasing, what that actually is happening is, yes, we got more revenue, but we haven't converted that new revenue into um, cash. If the accounts receivable go up, yes, yay, we got revenue, but boo, we haven't turned it into cash yet. Uh, that could also come not just from an increase in revenue, we could have a steady flat amount of revenue and our days um, of days in, in accounts receivable increases and as a result, uh, we have a higher accounts receivable just because maybe we're doing a, ba a worse job collecting or our insurers are dragging their feet uh, and paying us, uh, whatever it is. If, if accounts receivable goes up, then the amount of cash we have in our accounts uh, is, is actually overstated uh, by our uh, operating income. And so we have to adjust it and we adjust it downward. If we have an increase in inventories, all right, so think about this. If we have an increase in inventory, so we were carrying, again, imagine the bathtub, right? And say we were carrying $1,000 worth of inventory, and now we are carrying $1,200 in inventory or $1,195, just to make it match up here, $1,195 in inventory. How did we buy that inventory? Well, we might, might have um, uh, uh, bought it on... Um, uh, uh, on credit, um, and we'll get to that one in, in the next line deals with that. If we, but if we, if, but we don't know that. So what we're going to say is if we have an increase in, in inventories, we're going to assume we paid cash, which means that our cash is actually lower than um, uh, what we uh, captured as a result of our operating revenue. In part because we don't charge ourselves for inventory until it's actually used, right? So the amount of inventory we have is actually on the balance sheet, not on the income statement, remember? And so um, our changes in inventory don't get reflected on our income statement. And so therefore not reflected uh, in the operating expenses. Uh, so an increase in inventory over prior year uh, or prior period, we're assuming here that that was paid for in cash. Now, where that gets captured, uh, if it was if it was a, a, the result, if it was actually paid for uh, by um, a credit by purchasing on credit, we would see an increase in accounts payable. In this case, uh, we see a decrease in accounts payable. Right. So, if accounts payable go down, it's kind of the opposite of accounts receivable, or it is the opposite of accounts receivable. Accounts payable basically represent a, f a loan that we're getting from our suppliers, right? So if we order supplies, say inventories, right, from our regular supplier, and that organization says, here's, you know, $195,000 worth of supplies, pay us in 30 days, well, that becomes an accounts payable, right? And so we have this floating amount of money that we're all, we always are paying off, just like we have this floating amount of money that we're always being paid uh, by the people who have, uh, owe us money or the organizations that owe us money. So if this number goes down, that means that we are taking less advantage of the short-term loans that our suppliers uh, are making available to us or have historically made available to us. So in this case, our inventories went up and our accounts payable went down. So this is probably the case that we actually paid cash, right? As well as we've paid off some additional other accounts payable uh, without actually taking out more. So 
another decrease in the total amount of cash that we have on hand. Um, an increase in accrued expenses uh, shows us an increase. So this just means that we're basically, we have um, expenses that we charged ourselves for, right? So we've, if it's an accrued expense, we've charged ourselves for it in the expense portion, uh, the operating expense portion of the income statement. And so as a result, decreased the operating income. But if there are accrued expenses, that means we've charged ourselves for it and it's shown up here by lowering this number. But if it's accrued, it means we haven't paid it yet. And so in the, that makes the operating income actually understate the amount of cash. And so we add this back on. Now, this is a short term, again, like kind of like a short term loan. Um, but again, we haven't charged ourselves for it or we've charged ourselves, but we haven't paid the cash yet. And so you can see that what I'm trying to do or what this cash flow statement tries to do is, is sort out um, the effects of the accrual accounting. Okay. So then you get net cash flow from operations. And so we kind of balance, we balance all these things out, right? So we started with our operating income, added back our depreciation, but then we had a decrease in our accounts receivable, which means that we've, um, uh, uh, we've, we've, had uh, an increase in accounts receivable uh, as re and and been, um, which means we haven't been paid as much cash as we claimed from our revenues. We had an increase in inventories, which means we've pumped more cash into our inventories uh, without counting it as an expense. Uh, we had a decrease in our accounts payable, which means we're not taking advantage of uh, credit from our suppliers and other uh, vendors that we work with. And then, but then we also, we had an, had some uh, expenses that we've charged ourselves for, but haven't actually paid yet. And so that money is still sitting in our bank account. And so that all nets out to 5.9 million. Now, um, the second section gets into investing activity. So think about here, uh, you're purchasing assets for the organization. Um, so if, in this first line, investment in plant and equipment, it's a decrease in cash because in this case, we purchased new property, plant and equipment. Maybe we went out and bought, uh, so if this is 4.2 million, maybe we bought a new Da Vinci robot. Um, I just heard the other day, that was 2.5 million. And maybe we bought, I don't know, say, uh, some other large equipment or just netted out a whole bunch of you know, variety of equipment that we bought over the course of, of, of the accounting period. When we purchase those things, we are purchasing it with cash. And you're saying, well, what if I get a loan for that? Well, we'll deal with that in the next section. Uh, so, but for now, we're treating it as these, this line as if we purchased things with cash. And then investment in short-term securities means we're taking, really taking money out of our bank account and putting it into some sort of short-term security, right? So example, um, you know, a CD, right? That isn't quite cash, but it's pretty close. Like it could be converted into cash fairly easily, but it's not cash. Can't write a check off of a CD. You have to take at least one more step uh, to, to convert it back into cash. And so that takes money out of our bank account and puts it into some, an, a different um, security, uh, that's not quite cash. And so we have to reduce our amount of cash for that. So in this case, in this example, um, the investing activities resulted in a decrease in uh, cash to our organization. All right, the third part of the statement of cash flows deals with um, cash flows from financing activities. So now you see where we have the non operating income. Um, we add that back in. Uh, we have a repayment of notes payable. So you had a, so what that's saying is you had a loan and you paid it off. Um, and so if you, in order to pay off a loan, you have to spend cash. So the result was a decrease in cash because we paid off a $3.4 million note. Repayment of long-term debt. So again, we assume we're purchasing um, a, uh, or paying off a long-term uh, a, a long term debt in that in the amount of 2.1 million. And then we had a capital lease uh, principal repayment. So we had to 
again, paying down something that we had um, uh, um, that kind of functions like a loan, um, kind of like a purchase. It's an odd animal. Uh, and we'll get into that in another chapter. Uh, and it reduces, again, we paid something off. So again, paying something off reduces your presumed cash. And we had a change in the current portion of long-term debt that resulted in a higher amount um, uh, of cash available to us. So net cash flow here from financing is a negative 503, right? We're balancing out, mostly balancing out non-operating income uh, gains uh, against these changes. Now, if we had taken out, so in the previous screen, we talked about uh, purchasing plant and equipment. It wouldn't have been unreasonable to see on this next screen, um, new long-term debt that would at least in part offset the four point, whatever it was, 4.29 million um, in new property plant equipment purchases. Because very often when you have a, a large expensive purchase, you'll finance it um, by, by getting a, a, some sort of long-term loan. So we sum those three items together, right? We take the 5.9 million from operating cash flows, the 6.2 million, negative 6.2 million from investing, and the negative 503,000 from financing. Add all that together and we net out a negative 832. At the beginning of the year, if you go to their um, balance sheet for this organization, you would see that they had a cash, uh, the cash and cash equivalents uh, line on their balance sheet would have been 5,000 or 5,095,000. ,095 and so you add the net increase or subtract the decrease uh, here and you get the ending uh, cash of 4.2. So let's hop back real quick uh, to our, well, too far, income balance sheet. So cash, 5095 at the beginning. 4.263 at the end, right? So that's where you see the effect uh, or, or what the cash flow statement does is reconciles um, the cash and cash equivalence line of the balance sheet and tells us how much cash we actually have. And you can see some of the things on here like, oh yeah, we increased from zero to two, two million the amount of um, uh, short-term investments, right? Because we saw that on the... There was it? the um, sorry, the investment in short term securities here of two of two million. Right? So all these things are interrelated, and the cash flow statement, uh, it's a kind of a it's 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 really kind of a head scratcher. You have to get used to you know wait a minute, I'm increasing so that decreases things. I'm I'm decreasing something and that increases something. It's a little it's a little bit of a head scratcher. Like I said, it makes me a little crazy um, to to try to think these things through. You know, uh, it just takes a lot of practice to work it out. But you always have to ask yourself, okay, logically, um, if I do this particular transaction, what does it imply for my level of cash? And you have to separate that from the fact that, for example, if I buy a new car, what does that do to my level of cash in my bank account? Well, it would decrease my level of cash. Ah, but what if I finance that new car with a loan through the dealership? Well, that would increase my cash. So, on the one hand, right, buying my new car would be uh, an investing activity, right? So if I bought a twenty thousand dollar new car, um, and bear with me, you know, I'm a professor, not a not a you know, uh, an actual uh, healthcare executive, you know, so I drive a twenty thousand dollar car. Um, uh, but uh, so if I buy my twenty thousand dollar professor mobile, right, um, that is a negative twenty thousand here uh, as an investment in plants and equipment. But if I finance that twenty thousand through the Honda dealership, um, then I would see an increase, right, in notes payable of twenty thousand dollars, and so I'd have this offsetting, these offsetting entries where um, the investment would be negative twenty, but the cash flow from financing would be plus twenty um, because I got cash in and then cash went out simultaneously. So often you'll see kind of like transactions that are there's actually what we often think of as a single transaction are actually, in a sense, two transactions that offset each other. Okay. So, um, so summarizing what we saw, 
uh, operations provided about six million in new cash um, in 2015, but they invested about 4.3 million uh, in new assets and two million in short-term uh, securities. Um, and then they repaid a bunch of debt. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe uh, a slight decrease in cash, but it seems like they're putting that money to good use in terms of purchasing equipment. They're putting money in short-term securities and they're, and they're uh, reducing their outstanding debt. So could be, these could all represent good strategic decisions. Having a decrease in cash is not a problem as long as uh, the organization maintains a sufficient level of cash. Having too much cash is, is, is wasteful because cash doesn't earn interest or earns very little interest and it doesn't generate any new uh, income, right? You want to take your cash and you want to put it into some sort of investment, either an investment in the organization in the form of you know, building new buildings or you know, adding new services, or you want to put it into uh, a, a long-term investment that will hopefully grow and increase the, you know, the stability of the organization and, and uh, prepare the organization to make, you know, say, replacement of major capital assets, like replacing a, a hospital, replacing a building very expensive. And so not-for-profits will very often have large, uh, large um, amounts of cash, uh, or excuse me, large amounts of investments that they uh, uh, set aside in preparation for building out new, new uh, facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, not-for-profit, uh, excuse me, for-profit entities don't sit on a lot of cash because investors would rather have the cash than have the organization sit on the cash. So you typically see, uh, for-profit entities sitting on relatively low amounts of cash. Okay, so now we're going to move into the, the, the meat of this chapter, which is uh, financial ratio analysis, right? So ratios in general, um, you know, you can use ratios for all sorts of different things, not just finance, um, you know, so you think about things like, um, you know, car and how many miles per gallon does it get? Well, that's a ratio. And you use that ratio to compare, you know, when you're out car shopping and you're, you know, you're looking at, you know, let's say the, the Honda Civic, which is a perfectly respectable professor mobile, uh, as opposed to the uh, miles per gallon that, um, say, a new, uh, I don't know, uh, new big SUV gets. And so you'd say, well, you know, if I have a long commute, I really, you know, I really want a, a high um, uh, miles per gallon uh, ratio, but if I have a short commute, I don't care so much about the high miles per gallon. Or you know, if I make a ton of money uh, and I just want to look really cool in a fancy big SUV, um, then then uh, you know I might not care as much about miles per gallon. I might care about something else, a different ratio. Um, so so ratio analysis applies across all sorts of things. In this chapter, of course, we're primarily interested in um, the use of ratios for analysis uh, of, um, of organizations. Um, and we'll look at, we're gonna look at a, a number of different kinds of ratios. Um, but the idea here is that uh, ratios are really useful uh, to, because they help us combine together information or, or data in a way that makes it into information, right? Some, it takes just numbers and turns them into to actionable intelligence. Um, which, you know, is the difference between data and information. Um, it helps us make comparisons, like I was just, you know, saying, like, I'm comparing the miles per gallon that uh, the Civic gets versus, say, um, you know, the, uh, the Accord, right? And so, uh, you know, if I wanted to be really pretentious, I might get an Accord as opposed to a Civic. Um, but, uh, you know, the Civic, uh, the, the Accord has a bigger engine, uh, and so it has a lower miles per gallon than the Civic does. So, so that's, you know, that allows me to make a comparison across two different uh, cars, right? Uh, and so that, that is the usefulness of a ratio. So if I want to compare two hospitals, and they're never going to be precisely the same. Uh, you know, if I pull up their balance sheets and their, and their income statements, they're never going to be price precisely the same. And so I, I, it's often not particularly useful to compare, you know, oh, well, 
well, hospital X got this much revenue and hospital Y got, you know, 10% less revenue. Well, hospital X must be, you know, 10% better than hospital Y. Not necessarily, right? Um, it could be, you know, there's a, there are a lot of other factors there. And so ratio analysis helps us start to look at those other factors that I was just mentioning. So uh, in that spirit, right, one ra a single ratio probably, you know, a single ratio value certainly has very little meaning to it. Um, so if I just say to you, well, we have a profit margin of 7.3%, you say, okay, is that good, bad, you know, uh, indifferent? And it really depends, right? It depends on what kind of organization we're talking about. It depends on the time period we're talking about. It depends on a lot of things, right? So a 7.3 total or profit margin uh, for a hospital is pretty good. Uh, for a pharmaceutical um, uh, manufacturer, it's probably a little low. So, and for a grocery, um, so for a grocery store, for example, it's really high. Uh, or a restaurant, it's pretty high. Uh, so it really depends. You have to have a comparison point. Um, so we're going to typically look at um, two techniques. One is trend analysis, which basically means I'm going to care, compare myself to myself. So I'm going to get my profit margin for the last three years and I'm going to compare over time. How has my profit margin changed? And obviously, you know, profit margin, we want bigger. Uh, we talked about profit margin from uh, chapter three, I think. Uh, so we know, you know, bigger is better in terms of profit margin. Um, so I want to see my profit margin increasing over time. So if, if this year is 7.3, what was last year? Was it 6.9? Well, then I feel better, right? And if it was 5.8 the year before that, I feel even better. If last year was 8.7 and this year is 7.3, then I start to feel kind of bad. Um, the, other, uh, the other angle, so whereas trend analysis, I usually think of as comparing myself to myself, uh, comparative analysis, I would say, uh, is comparing myself to someone else, right? So I'm going to take hospital X and take their profit margin, which is a more meaningful number than just looking at their top line revenue and compare it to hospital Y. And I'm going to say, okay, if hospital X has 7.3 and hospital Y has eight, well, maybe now I could say hospital Y is actually better than hospital X. So either compare yourself to yourself over time or you compare yourself to others. Uh, both are useful and both you should do both. So some broad uh, categories for ratio analysis include uh, profitability. Is the organization generating sufficient profits? Uh, liquidity. Does the organization have enough cash on hand or easily liquefied assets that it will cover the uh, uh, liabilities that it has coming up quickly. Debt management, uh, is the business using the right mix of debt and equity, right? So, so and that's a, a question around capital structure, right? Or, uh, you know, an appropriate mix. It, it, there's, there, is, you know, there is a kind of right amount, and it depends in, in part on your industry as well as the, the particular time and, and the health of the organization. Uh, and then asset management, um, does, the asset, does, the, does the organization get a good return for its assets? So one more slide here. So two, two ratios that we, you should remember from Chapter 3 of Gapinski. Total margin, that takes your net income and divides it by total revenue. Um, and so in this, this, this case, this notional hospital has a, um, a total margin of 7.3. And then you have operating income divided by operating revenue. And in this case, it has a, um, a, a ratio of 3%. And so which one is, you know, which one is better or which one was, is more useful? Well, they're both useful, but you have to know they're telling you slightly different stories, right? In net income, when, you, when you're doing total margin and you're doing net income, you're talking about, uh, or you're including non-operating gains, right? And total revenue also includes non-operating gains. So this total margin measure goes beyond the operations of the, of the organ, the primary, you know, core operations of the entity. So if this is a hospital, what's getting lumped in here are things that have very little to do with what management is doing on a day-to-day -day basis, namely taking care of patients. What gets lumped in here are 
uh, in net income include things like, well, how did their investments do this year? Right? Well, what does that have to do with uh, the quality of the management team? It has very little to do with the quality of the management team and everything to do with how well the market is doing. And we've been in a um, bull market for about seven or eight years now. Um, and so uh, many hospitals are showing uh, nice non-operating gains as a result of returns on their investments. And that really can mask, you know, so if you only look at total margin, that can really mask some poor management or, or poor, uh, kind of poor core business financial condition, right? Um, the hospital itself might be doing poorly, but the, that fact is being hidden by the, by the, uh, by the, by the good luck that, um, you know, we've been granted from, you know, the health of the market. And so total margin does tell you something important. It tells you, uh, you know, the overall health of the organization. Um, but operating margin is the one that I, I like to look at if I'm trying to think about uh, whether uh, the organization uh, and the management of the organization is doing a good job uh, and whether the organization has long-term uh, sustainability because here you're focused just on uh, the things that management can control. Okay, so that concludes uh, part, the first part of three, uh, of my three-part lecture based on Kapinski's chapter 17. Uh, we'll put up a link to part two, which I'll start here momentarily.